we've never done a Montel like this before. Today, Montel's answering the tough questions. You had very serious bouts with suicidal attempts. In his new autobiography, Montel reveals his most private moments, from dealing with the pain of MS. Nobody around me could see it. I couldn't let my children see it. To thoughts of suicide. The pain was so bad. I wanted it to stop. A revealing hour. What I really truly have been doing has been kind of lying to you and lying to myself. Don't go away. That's coming up right now on Montel. Have a seat. Jeez, thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you so much for joining us today. You know, um, show's a little different today because every day for the last 13 years, I have sat in this chair and asked my guests some very difficult questions. Some of the most difficult questions they've been asked before in their life. And today, I decided to do the same to myself. I'm going to put myself in the same position that I put my guest, and that's allow myself to be asked some very, very tough questions and open up about some very, very personal moments in my life. Five years ago, I came forward and announced that, you know, to the world that I had MS. And the first show that I ever did about this was probably one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. Take a look at this. How many people in this audience here that have MS are not getting treatment right now because you can't afford it? Anybody? There should not be one person in this country with a disease that is this debilitating, this painful, this aggravating, that has to go, wake up every morning suffering. It, it's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. In that first show, I kind of, um, I think I really was trying my best to bring some awareness to this disease. And I think we kind of scratched the surface a little bit. But today, I want to dig a little bit deeper. I have, uh, the last couple of months, had the, the honor of being able to work with, I think, one of the best writers in this country, Mr. Larry Gobell. And I consider it an honor because Mr. Grabell um, sat down with me for like three weeks. And I said earlier that to do this first show was the hardest thing I've done in my life. No. The truth of the matter is, sitting down to do this book, which is called Climbing Higher, has been the toughest thing that I've ever done in my life. Um, I decided to do this, and why is it so tough? It's because... About a year ago, I was at a conference in, not a conference, at a fundraiser in Los Angeles called the Race to a Race, run by a lady by the name of Nancy Davis. And at that conference, I made a statement to people about who suffer with MS that a lot of us need to stop one thing, and that's to stop the lying. We spend a lot of time lying to our family, lying to our friends, lying to everybody around us, trying to hide what's going on inside of us because we're so afraid that. Somebody's going to turn it back on us. I know there are people in this country who watch me every day. You tune in every day. And every day I bring you issues and I talk about other problems. But what I really truly have been doing has been kind of lying to you and lying to myself. Most people in this country look at me and I hear this all the time. Montel, you don't look sick. Montel, you look great. Montel, I have to heard there was something wrong with you. You look okay. And sometimes that makes me feel good, but other times it cuts very deeply because then I realize how much I've been lying to people because you can't see which, what they... I suffer every day. And I don't, I'm not doing this show today because I want you to feel sorry for me. I'm not doing this today, and I'm not, I didn't write this book because I want people to feel sorry for me. I wrote this book because I want people to understand that there are people like myself in your family that may be suffering from cancer, may be suffering from anything from depression to MS to fibromyalgia, you name the illness. And sometimes they suffer in silence because they're just so afraid. I have based my life on being strong enough to do anything. I have told people that, you know, my first book was Mountain Get Out of My Way. That there was nothing so big that I could not overcome it. And I truly believe that. 
including this illness. But at the same time, I can say that publicly. But sometimes when I'm a <laughs> sometimes when I'm alone, it's the hardest thing I do is be alone. So, on the first show that I did about MS, I featured a supermodel and a television personality. Her name was Emmy. Emmy's own father suffered from MS. And she has been a tireless advocate for this disease and for those of us who suffer with it. And I thought today, rather than me sit here and just talk, I thought maybe that I should put myself in the hot seat and get interviewed for the first time. So I asked Emmy to come here and interview me. So I'll be the guest on my own show. Please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome our host today, Emmy. You get that seat. Ah. Montel, Montel, Montel. You are such an inspiration. Do you know how many people you're going to help? It's a brave act to be so vulnerable. It's, it's truly taking a walk on the wild side and walking off the edge and truly being you. Congratulations. <sighs> Thank you. Yeah. Amazing book. I want to read something to you. I didn't like the cocky manner this doctor had. I didn't like the blunt way he diagnosed me. But most of all, I didn't like him because he was the messenger. And what he was telling me was that my life was about to change. He was suggesting I go from being a strong, healthy, sexy, man to a weak, ill patient. I was 43 years old, and he was telling me that I was going to die. Tell me about that. In the last 20 something years of my life, um, way back, 1980, I think was when I probably had my first episode with MS. But it was completely misdiagnosed. I was at the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland, getting ready to graduate. Um, I woke up one morning after having had pre-commissioning physical and some immunizations. And I woke up the next morning almost blind in my left eye. Um, they overdosed you? Well, that's it. what we believe. And everybody else, the records show that, that back then. Unfortunately, you know, back then the military used to send you all through a line. You know, it was a hundred of us going through at a time. Guy has a gun, psh, 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 shooting people. Gun was set too high. Uh -huh. And it was set too high on one particular uh, uh, immunization, which was diphtheria typhoid. Right. It was set about seven times the dosage. Um, I took that dosage in my arm. You could have died, of, right? Well, you know, nobody knows. I mean, out of 100 <laughs> people that went through that line, three of us got sick. I ended up in the hospital. I ended up in the hospital blind in, in my left eye. Unrelated, because everybody's thought something odd had happened. Um, that is, by the way, a side effect of yes. MS. So, one, yeah, one, one of the, one one of of the very first symptoms that doctors see in almost all people who have MS is some sort of visual acuity issue, some sort of a, a neur optic neuropathy, optic neuritis, so it happens. So um, I'm diagnosed, I mean, I go to see the doctor after this happened, and from that point on for the next 20 years of my life, I was basically suffering from remitting, relapsing MS. You burned yourself and you didn't even know it. Nobody knew it. I saw doctor after doctor after doctor. You didn't feel it. And was misdiagnosed because all, one of my, some of my symptoms, I would get, get really, really, really numb in my left leg and I had a lot of pain in my left foot. And a lot of people don't know this about me, but when I was younger and I still am, even today, I'm an avid weightlifter. I used to bench press about 390. I used to squat about 585 on a regular basis. <laughs> I used to mess with you. <laughs> I used to deadlift about 500 pounds on a regular basis. I still deadlift about 400 now. Right. But back then, because I was doing so much weightlifting, I always thought I pinched my sciatic nerve. So I'd go to the uh, doctor and I'd say, I got all this pain in my leg and in my foot. He said, well, look at you, fool. You're lifting too much weight. Stop lifting the weights and everything will be okay. I'd slow down on the weightlifting. The symptoms would go away, but it had nothing to do with that. It was just remitting relapsing. Yeah. So when this doctor looks me in the face and says to me, you have MS, I had already gone down this path with other people and said, no, nah, wait, you're crazy, you don't know what you're talking about. Because... Someone it, mentioned this a long time ago as well. I had multiple doctors bring up the thought, well, we should check you for MS, but then again, look at you. And I mean, I, and I walk around right now. I, you and know, you never I'm, took I'm, it? I'm you never? No. So what did you do after you got the three big words? You have MS. I um, really, started the beginning do? of a spiral down 
into depression that, um, you know, that's a part of this book that I really was very happy about being able to write. Well, we're going to get back to hearing about your depression in yeah. just a moment. You got it. And I'm here today interviewing Montel on his show because he's written a very personal book called Climbing Higher. And it's about some of the hardest moments in his life. 60% of MS sufferers, um, survivors, I think is a, be a better word, um, deal and have to live with depression. Um, I know that you had um, a, a, a few very serious bouts with uh, suicidal attempts and um, I first want to find out from you are you depressed today you know um, I've been in a spiral for about the last two and a half weeks I have to do the show I go to work I have to, to to be with my children every day and I'm not gonna I, you know I have this weird way to deal with it and we're gonna have some people come out here and talk about that mm. um, but yeah and and I'm, I'm getting ready to slip into an abyss unless I do something about it I think you're doing something about it right now. I think so. I think you're doing something about it right now. Let's, um, let's talk about your first suicide attempt. Okay. Um, and I want to hold your hand for a second. Put your, give me your hand. I was hiding my disease from everyone. I felt alone, hopeless, and sorry for myself. On multiple occasions, I told Grace she should leave me. I didn't have low self-esteem. I had no self-esteem. I had guns, a lot of guns, nine guns, all registered, all legal, nine choices to blow my brains out and to end the misery I was in. That's the ultimate of being low, Montel. What was going through your mind that first time? It was in a closet, wasn't it? You know, what people, uh, there's some things about illness in this country that we do not understand, nor do we want to try to understand because as we try to, then we sometimes can take on another person's pain, and some of us don't want to do that, so we ignore it. Um, and you suffer alone. Yeah. When I was in the midst of my bout, which is an episode, so you understand, MS, there's remitting, relapsing, where it comes and goes in, in episodes, or there's another form of the disease, which is um, just uh, progressive. progressive, and then there's a benign form of the disease. The way I have the disease, I go through episodes or bouts. But fortunately for me, in the last couple of years, I've had an episode almost every two years. The last one was four years ago, and I'm fortunate, because now I think medication and the things that I'm doing is may, may be holding it back a little bit. Mm -hmm. I went through about four years ago where I literally, I'm here to tell you that I, I would have cherished an opportunity to have the nerve to blow my brains out because it was bad. I could not even, I had to get up every day and go to work. I couldn't let anybody around me know. Nobody around me could see it. I couldn't let my children see it. Where'd you let it, I mean, where did you? I'd go in the bathroom and scream. I go in, in the basement of my house and scream. I go outside. I would go hide. I would go grab something. Your in the friends. House. What friends were you able to just lay lay it all out on? You, you got to understand. I'm one of these people who, all my life, has attempted to live up to expectations that I don't think most people on this planet would even fathom. I've set expectations so high for me that are, in some ways, really ridiculous, and I've tried to live up to them. So then, when I thought that I had to go to those people who revere me and respect me. You didn't want to let him know. I didn't know that there was a, some sort of a kink. I didn't want to let him know. So instead, um, I spent, uh, I think in a book I said it was about 45 minutes. I probably spent about three and a half hours sitting in my closet um, in Connecticut. Um, it's about, oh, March of 1999, right? After almost April, right? Right well, before April, March of 99. A little bit after I got diagnosed, and I'm telling you, the pain was so bad, I wanted it to stop. And uh, the only thing that made me stop from pulling that trigger at that moment was the, the thought of the possibility of my children finding me in that closet. 
possibly my children knowing that their dad did this. And uh, even right now while we're taping the show, I have not discussed this with my kids. And I'm gonna leave here today and go home and talk to them about it because I want them to know this before everybody else comes up and says something to them about it. But yeah, you know, dad's not perfect. You're not alone, Montel. You're not alone. It's a real tough one to really believe when so many people who are so close to you pull away. Real art. You know what, we're gonna take a quick break and we're gonna get back to uh, talking to someone of our, uh, our professionals that are gonna talk about more of the MS uh, situation that's happening in our country sure. and all the, the things that we don't know about MS. We'll be right back.